Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, present all place and female things, come and dwell in us, cleanse every stain and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Okay. So I know we took uh, some time off uh, from uh, New Year's and Theophany. Um, can anyone kind of give me an overview of what we've been talking about before we get into step eight? Well, we did uh, <clears throat> remembrance of death and then mourning. Mm hmm. Sounds depressing. Was it depressing? <laughs> not really. Absolutely not. If anything, hard to understand, yes, yeah, right. I will grant yeah. you that that they are they are hard to understand. That being said, they are very very um, powerful. Uh, when we remember have a remembrance of death, focusing on what we're trying to achieve, uh, it makes our life more focused. When we have a understanding of mourning leading to joy, we can see how tears can be salvific. And this is very, very important because uh, in order for us to understand step eight, step eight is kind of the first step in um, really tackling uh, what we are trying to get away from. Uh, and I'm sure that as uh, you were reading step eight, you probably had a lot of moments of Oh, that feels familiar. Or oh, yeah, that's that's me. Um, and so I want us to to look into. It. There was so many good points in this that I actually had to stop highlighting stuff because I said, "All right, you know what? That's <laughs> there's so much here." So I'm very very excited to hear which ones each of you have uh, picked out. But uh, we definitely understand this was something that Dr. Ed had talked about in several classes before. The through line of we can't get to this point until we have truly understood the previous points. So until we have understood what it means to understand a focus on death and to understand what it means to have joyous mourning, uh, to basically desire that, uh, we cannot cross this border. And this is one of the reasons why at the end of the chapter, it basically says this, for some people, this is as far as they're going to get. Uh, because they cannot cross this border. So before we go into some individual takes, um, let's get some overviews. Um, Steve, what was sort of your overview of this step? Well, really, that the, um, the only way to conquer anger really is through weakness and humility. Mm hmm Very, very true. Pat? Well, I, I found that he actually found a couple of positive things, I thought, about anger, if I was understanding it correctly. Mm -hmm. He talked about how basically you could actually use anger to beat anger <laughs> yeah. to an extent, but it's you got to be careful with it. It's because basically you're, you're, you're playing with fire. Uh, and one of the later uh, little spots, he talks about how, you know, hand, when handled inappropriately, because it is such a individualized problem that uh, in certain cases, you need to run away from it entirely. Uh, Mrs. Tobias? And what are you asking for our overall? Your overall take before we start going into uh, favorite lines or prob problematic lines. Uh, let's go over our overviews. Uh, like we said, more like, you know, understanding that you can't, like, um, that it's a bad thing and you invite evil come into your soul if you're constantly, like, by yourself, and I've done the, you know, hashing over stuff and upset and, you know, and so forth, mm -hmm. and, you know, how uh, you should allow not allow yourself to do that that is just so damaging to your soul to constantly do that to constantly you know you see something and you get upset about it thinking about it even sometimes wake up thinking about it after you've slept mm -hmm. you know because you're upset correct you know and, oh, this is not that you should not be doing this that is so horrible okay is dr tobias there oh yeah yeah way over here It's, I have trouble putting things into words, but it, uh, this is a step. 
concept that uh, the whole nation needs to look at today. <laughs> it was my initial <laughs> thought. Well, we're not going to go into politics, but there is definitely a, a notion that we need to understand our purpose, to understand mourning, to understand death. Um, and more to the point, and this is something that uh, we're going to delve into a little bit more, is that we are going to be unable to tackle this particular demon if we are looking at the foibles of the other person. Right. Dr. Ed? Yeah, I thought that um, my general impression was that there, um, you know, there were a lot of approaches and he gives a lot of, of ways to deal with anger and he gives a lot of reasons of why anger is inconsistent with the Christian life. But I thought that, you know, kind of at the end, he does say, as you just said a few moments ago, that this is a very individualized problem. It's hard to kind of see the exact reason, find the exact reason why you're angry. And so he kind of, more than any of the other steps I felt, that he kind of leaves you to yourself to find the reasons, leaves you to yourself and your spiritual father to kind of come up with an individual remedy, if mm -hmm. you will. It was very uh, physician-minded uh, towards the end. Uh, talking about how we have to be delicate in how we try to extract it. We have to be delicate in understanding how our neighbor is dealing with it. Uh, that this is not something that you can just look at as a one-size-fits-all. So let's go ahead and look at some of our individual uh, prospects of it. Uh, Mrs. Tobias, what was one of the ones that stuck out to you? Well, I sort of enjoyed 29 because... <laughs> It was like where he talks about, tell us, space idiot, what is the name of the father, you know, who begot you, the mother who brought evil, you know, for evil into you know, the world, and he talks about, yeah, first I said, what does he say? And then as it went on, I said, oh, yes, I'm guilty of many of these things where, you know, in other words, like, the impression I got is he's talking to someone who feels like none of this is them, you know, they're just, you know, just off and, you know, Feel like you're perfect but then you say yeah you have this this conceit this fake glory mm -hmm. uh love of money uh greed in the sense of you know you're, you're you look at something and you, you want it and you know not to the point of like maybe like certain different different uh, you're angry that you don't have it and someone does right 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 and why how is this fair and mm -hmm. so forth you know you're going to see um, this throughout the ladder as we start to approach uh, each of the major demons. Uh, as we approach each of the demons, we're going to learn, uh, and again, this is very uh, almost medicinal in the sense that you're going to learn about the mother demon and then the children demon. Uh, what what begets these things? What is the source yeah. of these things? Because yeah, oftentimes when you're looking at spiritual ailments, uh, you're going to learn that there is more to it than this. So, for example, when a priest is sitting with you and he's listening to you talk about things like, like greed and things like that, these are all, um, oh, what's the term? Um, what are the what are the, what is it called for topical ailments? Um, it's not the root. It's um, no, it's uh. symptoms symptoms yeah that like you know for example like if your your jaw hurts and you think it's a toothache but it's not a toothache you have an ear infection right. Mandibular, mandibular or something right the point is is that you're looking at symptoms and that's not necessarily the root problem you're concerned about the symptom you think that symptom is here all end all but what the physician or the priest is like it's like wait what we're really dealing with here is anger and what we're dealing with is beyond that too and so I like Go ahead. So I'm just going to say that I like what you talked about, that uh, my opponents are, who are holding me captive are the opposite virtues of freedom from anger and meekness. Mm -hmm. You know, I just I just like the way that was all put out there because you can put yourself in there and say, uh, yeah. 
But you see a little bit, this, this, this is a very encapsulating little verse because when it says, the one that schemes against me is humility. In other words, when we seek to be humble, and what does humility actually mean? What does it mean to be humble? Because hum humility and meekness are oh, mirror oh. images of each other. I thought it was meekness, that you are accepting, that you are, you know, as I, now I understand meekness, humility more, is that no matter what comes your way, be it praises or evil, or someone is you know, speaking malice against you that you feel is the truth, you just, you know, don't let it go, just let it go, don't even say anything. It is true that meekness is like the rock in the river that is unmoved. Whether, no matter which way the waters go, it's not moving it. But that's not exactly humility. Humility needs to be understood not as something as self-deprecation, but as what exactly? What is it to be humble? What does it mean to be humble? Well, okay, isn't the root of humility and humbleness is... Uh... Like hummus, like the uh, word for earth or something like that? It means to know what you are. Self-knowledge. The person who is humble knows exactly who and what he is. He knows his strengths. He knows his weaknesses. He knows what he is in front of his God. So to be humble means to know exactly who you are. To know what you are, your strengths, what you should have, what you shouldn't have. That is humility. That is why God, Jesus Christ, is perfectly humble. Jesus Christ was not self-deprecating. Jesus Christ was humble because he knew who he was. He didn't make outlandish statements or, or genuflections towards something that he wasn't. He was humble and meek. So these are two powerful virtues that basically make you immune to anger. Because if you know who you are, to actually know yourself, then it doesn't matter what someone says about you because you know who you are. You're not being influenced one way or the other. I know what I am. I know where I am in my progression of my life. So I know what I am. So I'm not going to be angry by that. And to be meek means that I am unmovable. So in order to basically get away from each of those things, to scheme against these the villainous symptoms of anger, is to know yourself, to find true knowledge of who and what you are. So yes, this was a very powerful statement of, you know, basically, if you can name your enemy, you can conquer your enemy. Dr. Tobias? Well, 22 stuff struck me because we had been talking earlier. I can't remember if it's in class or just a personal call about how one person can affect the other, mm -hmm. and uh, how one person can cause turmoil, like you throw a rock in the water and it, the ripples go out all over. Mm -hmm. But then just the converse could be true by someone being humble and that influence absolutely that that is the the crux of spirituality is that one person can bring peace that we we look at the negative all the time we've heard the experience oh a fly in the ointment uh that you know oh they ruined it they ruined it Whereas one person can bring peace, one person can bring calm. And I love that image that he uses of a skin of oil on the water. The idea that it's perfectly smooth. And we see this within the person of Jesus Christ, because in that moment where the disciples were in the stormy waters, which is analogous to the stormy waters of our soul, the anxieties that we're feeling, the worries, the fears, and one person with just a word, and it was like glass, like oil on water, smooth. And so that person who is calm, who is meek, who does not rise to the occasion, can cause other people to be calm. It's as if it sucks the oxygen out of the flames of the temper around him. It's amazing. 
where you're getting heated, you're getting heated, then you see someone absolutely serene. And you're like, oh, well, I guess I, maybe I'm not as angry as I think I am. Because that one person present is so calm, so peaceful, that it changes the way you look at the situation. So yes, it is nice to look at <laughs> as a positive example to say, yes, it is possible for a saintly person to do this. Well, Father, um, uh, I think it's the only Ethiopian from any the Western Catholic Church, but the Eritreans, is that the same thing? Well, I still, you know, remember, I think he's passed since then, but this one man was, to me, so holy. I mean, he, he used, he emanated, when you were near him, you just felt calm, mm -hmm. you know, because he himself, you know, I don't know, I felt this is a holy person because you just felt it. And to right. this day, I still think of him. When people are holy, the grace wells of them like they're, like they're like water spigots, and it just keeps flowing out of them. And you feel good being in their presence because you feel their peace flowing into you. Yes. I mean, it was an amazing man, really. You just felt it. Pat? Uh, okay, I, I am too, but... Uh... Number 15, I thought was so interesting because he contrasts, if I'm reading it correctly, an explosive kind of anger, mm -hmm. which is not as insidious as a quiet but seething kind of resentment that builds up over time. Mm -hmm. That the explosion of anger can be like a release and help you let go of the anger, whereas if you don't, it kind of builds up inside of you. Am I reading that one correctly? No, you are. You're reading it correctly. That that basically, like any sin, it is far more damaging when we give it a home to rest in. So that momentary flare up of of passionate anger is bad, but it is not as bad. Even though you think that it's because it was explosive, but it's not as bad as that seething remembrance because right. anger I'm, i need to find where it is but, um where it talks about the idea that basically it's remembrance of wrongs yeah, yeah. the idea that uh you are not letting it go yeah. and because you do not let it go and you're always thinking about that injury uh yeah, that Yes, the beginning of uh, freedom from anger is silence of the lips when the heart is agitated. The middle is silence of thoughts when they are mere disturbance of soul, and the end is impenetrable calm. Yeah, that's the success. Um, number five, anger is a reminder of hidden hatred. That is to say, remembrance of wrong, that hidden poison inside you. And the thing about it is, why that insidious one is there is because, and this is where number five really kind of hits at the point of what you're talking about there, Pat, is that Anger is a desire for the injury of the one who has provoked you. And that is, it's funny because I hear so many times people say, oh, I don't want anything bad to happen to that person. Well, but yes, you do because you're angry. You can say it. It's like when someone says, oh, I'm not bothered. I'm not bothered. I'm not bothered. It doesn't bother me. It's like, well, I think you protest a little too much because <laughs> your attitude is certainly showing the opposite. And Father, is it also like when people tell you, let's say, they're upset with you, and they say, well, I forgive you, but I'll never forget. Uh, yes, yes. Correct. Yes. That, is, that is not forgiveness, yes. and that is certainly not uh, a release of the anger. Um, this is one of the reasons why um, confronting things is important. Because what happens is, is that when things are not confronted, when you do not address a grievance with a brother or sister uh it has a tendency to fall into this uh it allows either that person or you to basically hold on to that anger and seed and then it becomes that poison that just constantly gets building 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 and so that's why it is far better to address something even if it's uncomfortable because one of the things that we have a tendency to do as humans is, you know, oh, well, you know, 
forgive and forget. Well, we didn't really forgive and we really didn't forget. We're just hoping that it doesn't happen again. But then when it does happen again, we get angry again. And what we've done is we've not allowed the other party to heal either. And so it's very, very important that we address things, even if it's going to be uncomfortable, because that allows us to actually heal from it and not allow this anger to seethe inside the other person. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, Father, uh, in uh, Patrick Michael's uh, letter, he said something to the very point. He said, I myself find it much easier to allow myself to get angry and sin, not a little bit at a time, coming to God in prayer and confessing my sin in order to remain as humble as I can. Let me pull this up. Thank you for reminding me. I completely forgot to pull up his letter for class. It's in the uh, second to the last paragraph of his notes. Is that was did was that from Pat or from uh, Steve the letter? I, I sent the Steve sent it to you on the thirteenth. Okay. Pulling it up. There it is. Okay. I find it much easier to allow myself to get angry. All right, let's look at this. Um, actually, no, I'm just going to read the entirety of his letter uh, because oftentimes it's, it's actually a powerful discussion point. Um, and then we'll do uh, Steve after, uh, after we do Patrick. While studying this step, I was asked to focus more on meekness than anger. For myself, I find that conquering the passion of anger leads to humility. There is a time and a place for anger and a time for being meek. Our Lord said plainly that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. To truly understand this, we must see, not see ourselves as slaves to our passions. Instead, we must be masters of them. I am a Scots-Irishman, amongst others. And most Scots-Irish, I used to be easily offended. And once offended, I felt violence was the answer. As I've grown in faith and come into orthodoxy, I now have the power to see that humility is of great importance to the process of humanity. Even our Lord was unable to control his, control his anger, and he had a righteous outburst in the temple. But 90% of the gospel, he is humble in heart and the true Lord of the universe. Another time we see, well, I argue that point just a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, but 90% of the gospel, he is humble of heart and the true Lord of the universe. Another time we see an angry outburst at the fig tree, but that was more for a metaphorical purpose than anything more. St. John notes that there are steps to overcoming the plague that is anger, and I believe that it is because there is some, some other emotion that is bothering the heart. Once we are able to see things clearly, then we are able to control our other emotions. This is where, in that sense, he's grasping the, the notion of what humility is. Because once we can see things clearly, then we know what was actually problematic, and then we can control our emotions. Being humble is not a weakness, it is true strength. The peacemakers are humble in heart, and they are called children of God. So we must follow our, we must allow our emotions to be explored and let our what let out what bothers us before we explode. Our commander at Vasilios Papa Vasiliu, uh, I myself find it much easier to allow myself to get angry and sin not a little bit at a time, coming to God in prayer and confessing my sin in order to remain as humble as I can. But like everything, I'm still working hard to overcome the little angry outbursts that make me look like a fool. I hope this is, a not, is on topic and not coming off as though I'm rambling. <laughs> not at all, Patrick. Um, there needs to be an understood thing that when Jesus Christ was angry, his anger was righteous anger. It was the kind of anger that we're talking about here, which is appropriate. Being angry at uh, his father's house, uh, being used as a place of business, was righteous anger. Uh, where he is destroying the, uh, the, basically the marketplace that is making a mockery of the temple. And also the anger at the fig tree, yes, that is correct. That is metaphorical. And as a part of creation, it's basically showing us what is awaiting us if we do not bear good fruits. Um, so it's very, very important that we understand humility as trying to understand what's wrong. How can we fix ourselves if we don't recognize in ourselves what is wrong. That is humility. That's what leads to meekness. So very powerfully stated. When he says there, we, we are able to control our emotions, um, isn't that, is that like the last uh, line of this whole step? 
where he talked about he who wears it by nature will perhaps wear no other crown. But he who has won it uh, by sweat has conquered all eight together. Mm -hmm. and they're, they're referring to eight emotions or the eight passions. Kind of the, the mother demons that he's going to be talking about. So in other words, this, this step, this step of anger is basically the spot that can take us out at any moment. He talks about it in another place too, where he's seen that in a single moment of anger, all of your hard work, all of your spirituality can just be ripped apart. Now, another reason why this is so problematic and why it is so damning is because anger, by its very nature, is judgment of others. And by the Lord's own metric, we are judged by how we judge our brothers and sisters. So by getting angry at our brothers, we have a problem. And this is one of the reasons why I love the... Uh, uh, Line 27, I once saw three monks receive the same injury at the same time. One felt the sting of this, but kept silent. In other words, he recognized himself, he got angry, but then he was like, no, stop it. Don't, don't do this. The second rejoiced at his injury for the reward it would bring him. In other words, he that you know reached that holy state of when bad things happen, he was like, oh, thank God. Yes, wonderful. Go ahead. I don't care. Very holy person. That's that's the next step. And the last, but was sorry for the wrongdoer. And the third, thinking of the harm his erring neighbor was suffering, wept fervently. To the point where basically he was not grieved by what had happened, but saw what was happening to his brother, his neighbor, and that choked him up. He was so sad. And fear, reward, and love were to be seen at work. So in other words, these are the three ways that we can conquer our anger. Fear at what anger can do to us, how it can lead to judgment. The reward of understanding how not getting angry is in itself a reward and brings us closer to God. And then love. If we are able to love our brothers and sisters to not get angry at them, then we become like God himself. That's our goal. And so that's the powerful notion of just how dangerous anger can be. It can ruin everything because we, and into, we lean into the judgment of our brothers and sisters and therefore render our forgiveness moot. It's that deadly. That's why forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us is so important and it cannot be in lips only. This is why Jesus Christ said, with your heart, in your heart, you must forgive. So Steve, let's get to you now. Which one was your favorite? Well, actually, I, I, I talked to the judge who was first. I mean, that's fine. Um, and I think that the judge who was first was That is so, it's like a mathematical equation. It's like logic personifies. Right. It's like, if this is true, as we say it in, you know, just, you know, theory, but it is true. Yeah. <laughs> it is actuality. This is true. And so the reality is, yes, if we are trying to acquire the Holy Spirit, as St. Seraphim of Sarov says, that's our goal too. To acquire the Holy Spirit gives us the virtues of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, makes us like God, makes us recognizable to God, by God. So in order to acquire those fruits, we have to get close to the Holy Spirit, to invite him in. Well, nothing is going to push away the embodiment of peace than anger. When we are anger, we shove away the Holy Spirit. There is no room inside of us because of that. And that is very, very frightening, very, very dangerous, because essentially 
when we are angry, we are telling God, get away from me. That is one of the reasons why when we see the parable of the ten virgins, when we see uh, other parables, when Jesus Christ says, I have no idea who you are, that's why. Because when we are angry and we push away God, how can he recognize us? Because we've given in to our anger. So this step is so quintessential because it shows us how we are basically able to be draw, brought down low immediately. This is one of the reasons why in the icon of the ladder of divine ascent, you see a priest, I think it might even be a bishop, towards the last step getting pulled down because this step can pull us that way even if we were near the very top. It's that dangerous. And so it has to be handled like a serpent, like the snake it is, and not, as Pat said, allowed to slither in. That seething anger is poison. It's, it's like quicknine. It's arsenic. It's whatever you want to call it. If it's in you, it's going to kill you. And that's no joke. <laughs> Dr. Ed? Uh, a lot of the ones that I had highlighted have already been discussed, um, but really the whole thing is is really great. Um, the first several where the definitions I thought were great because they kind of give you, you know, they set the stage for the whole thing, really. But I guess I, I, I'll look at number 25, even though it seems like one of the most of the explicitly monastic passages here where he's talking about someone who is easily overcome by conceit and temper should flee to the monastery mm -hmm. and they should seek out the most austere one and that you know, by being insulted and what is it physically thrashed trampled on and kicked he can wash out the filth which is still in the perceptible perceptive part of his soul mm -hmm. And you should believe the popular saying that reproof is the washed up for the passions of the soul. And I guess this is kind of the part where it seems like you can actually apply this to even for non-monastics. Non you can, you know, if you're being reproved, even if it's in an angry way, you can somehow, I don't know, take, a, take an out-of-body look at the truth of what's being said about you or to you even in maybe hostile words, and that will somehow serve as a, a scrubbing for you. I appreciate this. It, I gave him a scrubbing because if, if that, if that was a saying back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny because it's true. And it reminds me of one of my lines from Proverbs that I absolutely love. If you reprove a scoffer, he will hate you. If you reprove a wise man, he will love you. And what that is basically saying, and this is where this becomes pertinent to not just the, mon the monastic life, but also to our life, is that constructive criticism can be very, very helpful if we can humble ourselves to receive it. Because even when it's being given in an indignant fashion where we're being you know, yelled at or being mocked, there could be an element of truth to that where it's like, oh, wait a second, actually, I, I do do that. And I do need to change that. And even though that person was uh, trying to put me down, was trying to, to harm me, that was actually the best thing for me. Has that ever happened in any of your lives where you got made fun of, and instead of uh, you know letting it get you down, you thought, and not in the not in the way of like, oh well, I'm going to show him, I'm going to I'm going to get it done, but to say, you know what? Not in a despairing way of like, oh, they're right, oh, I'm horrible, but. I do need to change that. That That is something I need to change in myself if I want to become a better person. I think that that is a very, very, um, how do I put it? Where the uh, the rubber meets the road, as it, way, as it were, with, the, <laughs> with this step is, how do you deal with constructive criticism? Do you react in anger? Or do you accept it with joy? And Father, speaking of constructive type of criticism, 
I'm reminded of another passage that I, I thought was great was uh, 20 about using a lancet rather than a um, rather than a stick. So, and I took that to mean to if you to criticize someone gently and constructively, if you will, rather than hammering at them with a, with a stick. Absolutely, because the reality is that when we beat somebody with the stick, unless that person loves us, that's why it says like, unless absolutely necessary. Yeah. And that's, you know, kind of like any parenting, like you would never, you don't spank unless you absolutely have to. Uh, because what happens is that when you are, you know, trying to admonish somebody, if you do it in such a way that you're putting them on the defensive, then they're not listening to you. They've, they've put up their guard, they're, they're completely blocked off. But if you're able with love to gently talk about what needs to be changed, you're far more likely to reach in with that lancet, which is like these little tweezers, and pluck out the offending particle that can lead to the infection. But you'll never get it if somebody's thrashing around in anger and in righteous indignation because they feel that they've been wounded by your harsh treatment. And so this is one of the reasons why even when somebody is correct in their argument, it doesn't matter if the way that you address it causes the other person to not hear you. So harsh. Exactly. Right. And even for myself as a priest, I've, I've, I've learned more to, to grow on this, to, to learn how to, um, to deal with that. Because there were times where I would get upset at certain things. And I would think, oh, I need to give them a strong talking to. And then I've realized more that that actually doesn't help, doesn't actually accomplish much other than putting the person on guard, making them perhaps ashamed. What they respond better to is your love, your kindness, your example. And sometimes if you, in a roundabout way, in a gentle way, talk about an issue where they're not even aware that you're talking about them, and then they, in their heart, is like, yes, that's right, that's right, that's right, not knowing that you're leading them to address something. And then they come away saying, wow, I, I think that I should change like that. Really? That's beautiful. Never knowing that that's where you wanted them to go in the first place. And so that's why it's so important to understand that reacting in anger or trying to beat someone over a head with something is certainly not going to help them, not in any kind of long term function. Now, some people, as uh, St. John of the Ladder says, some people need that. That the only way they're going to be saved <laughs> is to be beaten with an inch of their life, both both metaphorically and physically, within the monastic uh, life. Um, but of course, he's again similar to what we were talking about before with the uh, regarding uh, the dungeon. Uh, that is an extreme example meant to basically call to attention uh, the broader strokes that is supposed to help us. Does that make sense? I'd like to add a little But let's say, you know, whatever's in there, you know, you need a doctor to take that out with a very careful with the lancet. And then, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're out of the woods. So when you're home by yourself, you might have to put some staff on that on that sword to make sure it doesn't get you know infected or something. So I guess what what I'm saying when you when when somebody is trying to give you this kind of reproof in the right way, you know, you have to, it, it doesn't stop there, you have to do something. And that goes back to what Dr. Ed was talking about towards the beginning, the idea that basically it becomes very individualistic. And what you're talking about really kind of fits into 18, where he basically says that it could be dangerous for someone to stay in their cell in isolation if they're wrestling with this. Sometimes they need to get out, to be around other people, to be, to have that that solve because otherwise they could basically become like a wild animal in their cell, uh, slowly spiraling out of control and becoming like a wild beast. And so it's very, very important that care, constant care is being addressed on this. That you're right, this, this, could, this is not a one and done thing and it never will be. It has to be done continuously. And it has to be done with a lot of attention on what's happening. 
You're absolutely uh, right. Uh, Father, uh, number nine, what, what is it trying to say here about when the demons leave us, we have to be more basically on guard? Is what they're saying, on guard of that we are not fighting our passions? Because what, they... what, what basically it means is that sometimes the demons leave us. In other words, you don't feel anger. And this is very, very dangerous because what can happen is when you have not been, you know, ready for the fight, what happens? You lower your guard. And then something happens, and then you are completely enraged, completely upset, and you feel like, well, wait a second, I thought I was a good person. And this is one of the reasons why, and I've seen this so many times in both confessions and in life, uh, of people that not only did they get beaten by the demon, but then they get angry at themselves because they got beaten, which leads to a one-two from the demonic kind of bringing the person to utter destruction. And that's why this happens, is because the person was led into a false sense of security. This is one of the reasons why anytime things are going well or calm, I'm on edge. Because <laughs> I know that something is going to happen. <laughs> Not because God is out to punish, but because you know we are in war. And... Uh, when you're not prepared, that's when the enemy is going to get you. He's going to make an attack, and you may not be ready to face that attack. And especially with this particular passion, because it can be ruinous and take all of your gains and completely throw it out the window, you have to be especially on guard for this. And that's so why... Do that. What was that? The demons deliberately would do that kind of thing. Where they just sort of like they play the long game. They know what they're doing. <laughs> they know that if they can get you into a, lull you into a sense of, you know, everything's okay, we're fine, I'm a good person. And then, boom. You know, it's kind of like sometimes you see on occasion, very sad times, when someone that you saw was very religious, very pious, very faithful, that everything was going well in their life. And then suddenly tragedy hits, something very bad happens, and that person's faith just goes away. And the person says, well, why did this happen to me? I was a good person. I'm a good person. And we recognize that you know, we don't know ourselves. We're not ready. We're not prepared for when that attack happens. And so we have to be on guard that that attack can and will happen when we're least expecting it. And so that's why it's very, very important when we find ourselves caught in that momentary moment of anger to immediately throw it away. To realize you've just been handed a, a live hand grenade and you need to get away from it fast rather than let it come at you and blow you up. Because that's what anger can do. Final uh, thoughts. On the I had a question for you, Father. If yeah. Don't mind. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of surprised in this chapter that you know other treatments of anger that I've seen um, kind of go about it the same way. They examine it as a, a passion in the same way that St. John does here. Mm -hmm. um, and they essentially treat it like when you're angry at your brother, you're judging him, as you said earlier, which is exactly what you shouldn't be doing. But then there is... Um, there's often a kind of treatment of it as a positive faculty of the soul. Mm -hmm. The only true use of anger should be against the demons who are attacking you. Correct. But Saint John doesn't really get into that here, and I'm wondering if you, if I, if I've just missed it, or maybe you have a reason why he doesn't treat it here. Why he's not looking at the idea of of righteous anger? Yeah. Um, I'm only going to be theorizing here, so I don't want this to be taken as um, as necessarily the orthodox answer on this. Uh, my theory on this is in similar fashion to when St. Paul talks about not being able to use solid food when talking to people, he's giving them milk, is because, because this is such a dangerous um, element uh, that it could be very, very deadly. And he does talk about anger in other places of the latter, so we will get there. But it could be that he is looking at this as such a volatile and dangerous element that even though it does have the potential to be used against evil, true unrighteousness, 
uh, it can be misunderstood and therefore given almost justice in the sense where we would then try to say, well, in similar fashion to what we saw in the letter where, uh, well, God got angry. Well, there's a difference. There's a huge difference in that. And so I think what he's trying to get us to do by speaking in the hyperbole, not even addressing that element, is to basically say, this is deadly dangerous. You need to flee far, far, far from it. Uh, and then when you probably get a little more advanced, then you can deal with that anger and say, okay, this is how you would apply it to this. We get angry at the warfare. We get angry at the enemy that is actually attacking us. And we do see it to a small extent in the sense that uh, if we look at step uh, 29, where it says, tell us base idiot. Where you see that is anger and that is antagonistic to the extreme where it's talking about your real enemy. Who is the real enemy? The real enemy is anger and the demons. And we're talking about our real enemy here. And so, as I said, that there will be this um, theme as we continue down the ladder where St. John is going to label our enemy uh, and how we combat the enemy. Um, but as far as looking at the righteous anger aspect of it, um, I think that we, uh, I feel ignorant saying this. I, I don't know why St. John is not uh, talking about it this other than to say that he will probably address it later on in the ladder in a way that is more rounded with a theme that is more appropriate to it, if that makes sense. I apologize if that answer is lacking. No, it's not. Thank you. All right, Dr. Uh, Tobias, what is your final thoughts on this chapter? No, we work a lot harder. <laughs> yes, we do. We all have to try to strive for humility, self-knowledge to know where we're lacking so that we can combat this. Um, Mrs. Tobias? Yeah, I mean, like what you said in the intro, I feel like that's what I was reading throughout this, like, oh, I'm guilty of this to one extreme or the other. And it's like, hmm. I mean, this rarely applies to me. I'm, you know, I'm very guilty of many of these things. And I think like, if we're being honest, most of us would be if we... Uh... <laughs> and I thought, well, and I see, well, I should be combating this, you know, and I don't think a lot of us realize we should be combating this. We just let it rip, so we let it... Fester, and we're not even maybe talking, but just something. We're just like, arr, 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 you know, and that is not a good thing. And reading this, I that brought a lot of that to the forefront. This is beautiful because the reality is, is that the evil one thrives in our ignorance of this, um, and unfortunately, we see so often, many times in ourselves, this idea of self-righteous justification. I'm right to be angry because. As opposed to recognizing that even if that's true, it's damaging you, it's hurting you. And then what unfortunately happens in these cases of self-righteousness, it's like, then you get angry. So, well, I'm angry at you that now I'm angry and hurting myself. <laughs> so it's very, very destructive to the self. And so the only way to do that, as we said at the beginning, is remembrance of death and mourning to even approach getting to humility and meekness. There's no other way. Steve? Well, just this, uh, 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 I guess this, this thing about letting something see and, and building up resentment over time, I, mean, I think that that's uh, really important to watch out for that. Because, like I said, if you don't, uh, you don't do that. If you let that happen, it's just going to burst out. And that probably, I mean, that could be more dangerous, although it could also jar some change. So, um, but this, this is uh, as much as maybe that one point was for the monastics, but it seemed like the rest of it. Which part is that, Steve? Right. But maybe there's that one point that was written for the monastics, but it seemed like the rest of it. 
all of them. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. And it kind of gets to what you what you just said, Steve, that, you know, there could be good from sometimes an outburst. For example, you know, when Jesus did what he did, of course, it was for good. Uh, and this really gets down to the idea of intent. Why are you doing what you did? If you're doing it because of anger and wanting to be justified and wanting to uh, conquer another person and show you are right, uh, even if in the end, uh, there will be, quote unquote, a better good, then that's a problem. If you did something that could be considered, um, like, let's say, for example, uh, a police officer uh, tackles somebody uh, to stop a crime. Now, if that per police officer did it out of malice and hatred towards the person that he did it to, that's a problem. If the police officer tackled the person because that is what the police officer has to do to prevent the crime and there is no malice or ill will in it, then that is not a problem. And so, yes, there can be actions that look the same, but have very different motivations and uh, personal views in them. And so it's very, very important that we look into ourselves and ask ourselves when we do something, especially if it's something that can cause um, problems or anger in another person, why did I do it? Well, it's, it's the flip side of what you were talking about in the Proverbs. So, I mean, what, you know, how are you getting reproof? You know, if it is how is the reproof received, one, the wise man, you know, will receive it and love you, and whereas the stopper, I guess, is going to, you know, hate you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it also could be turned around and how is the reproof? Is the reproof, like you're saying, is it given in anger or is it given to instruct? Right. And the truly saintly person, it won't matter which way it was given. The saintly person, it won't matter because the saintly person will take it and ride with it and will accept the reproof regardless of whether it was done with ill will or not. Uh, the saintly person won't care. But for us who are dealing with an unsaintly, it is important for us to understand that we have to be loving and giving in a Christ-like manner, not in a world-like manner. So you're absolutely right. Pat? Well, I agree with Steve of all the steps we've covered and Mrs. Tobias of all the steps we've covered. I think this one is really the most approachable. And you don't have to be preparing for the monastic life to get something out of out of this step eight. And I, I do have a question too. Um, in my mind, I'm making a distinction, maybe not correctly, between being angry at something that's being done to us, which is dangerous, versus being angry at an injustice that you see out in the world being angry at uh, a system or a group of people that are being unjust toward another group of people. I see. So there, this is, you, you kind of answered your own question as to where it draws a line, is that you can be angry at injustice without being angry at the person or the people. Because the second we draw that distinction of an us, them, they are the perpetrator, they are the evil, they are the ones doing wrong, even though what they are doing is wrong, even though what they're doing is evil, uh, we have drawn a line that is not going to work out for us I as spiritual okay, beings. Okay, the crime, but not the exactly. Hate the sin, okay. not the sinner. Exactly right. Okay. Okay. So I'm upset at what is happening while still loving you as a person. Oh, that's that's rough. That's hard. It's a hard line. It's a very hard, hard line to follow. Dr. Ed? Yeah, I think uh, like everyone, you know, there were certain things in this that really hit home. One of the things that occurred to me is like um, uh, sort of um, criticism, and I'm thinking especially in maybe a professional setting where someone's criticized you for it, and there's an instinct to get angry and defend yourself against that immediately. Mm-hmm. Even though you might recognize, you know, they're
um, you know, combining that with what Pat has been saying, you know, there's, a, there's letting, your, letting yourself be controlled by anger versus controlling your anger as a tool to fight injustice or, you know, even though it's not specifically talked about here, you know, I think you, your ability to harm is different than the type of anger that's really being talked about here. Correct. In the very last line in 29, uh, where it's talking about, you know, conceit. I am conceited. So when someone, con uh, when someone criticizes my work and I get upset, even if And that's true for a lot of us, but that that's the that's the mother of it. That's you know, anger is is the main thing we're dealing with the the unruly son, uh, but his dad is conceit, self pride, and things like that. And that's where it becomes the intent behind it. Why am I angry? What has got me angry? at the injustice. If that's the case, yes, I'm angry at injustice. I'm angry at hunger. I'm angry at, uh, at problems in this world that are hurting other people. Absolutely, I'm angry with that. But without letting it cross over to the I'm angry with this person. When we demonize another human being, we have lost sight of our true enemy. So, uh, Father, the thing I guess is hard for me as a human, I guess, is that do you feel, I mean, I feel anger, let's say, if I'm unjustly accused of something, but the impression I get from reading the steps is even though that might not be true, that I should not react? Absolutely right. Jesus Christ said, blessed is the man who is, who is uh, all kinds of manner of evil and lies are said about you falsely for my sake. In other words, if you're a good person and you're a humble person and someone unjustly speaks about you, at the end of the day, if you're able to look at yourself in the mirror and you know that God is looking at you as for who you really are, then what does it matter what anyone thinks about you? You're right, Father, but sometimes it's very difficult to feel you're not kidding. Like you should defend yourself. Like, wait, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> true. So the question you have to ask yourself in that regard is, and please don't take offense to me saying this, but are you a man pleaser or a God pleaser? So in other words, why do you care what that person thinks about you? Is that person's opinion so important that it is causing you distress? Especially if it's somebody that you may never see again. Or if you know that that person is going off of a false model of you. Because the reality is that people make false models and narratives all the time. People are going to lie about you all the time. People are going to hate you. So, are you supposed to try to live your whole life saying, well, I've got to do this because otherwise they're going to think this about me? No. Live your life rightly, justly. Let the chips fall where they may. Because if you are constantly trying to prove yourself to somebody that you think that, oh, well, they, they falsely said this against me. Okay. Okay. If they're able to listen to you in a rational dialogue, fine. But if they're not, then just say, take it on the chest and say, okay. That's okay. It's, well, it's kind of when you, when you say, you're never going to see that person again. You may never see that person again. I mean, what came to my mind was road rage. Mm -hmm. no, either way, I'm being on the receiving end of it or I'm giving it. Uh, what good is it? Exactly. I mean, it, could, it could actually cause much more harm to either yourself or the other. And this is where, if we look to the to the love of the the three people that received harm in the same exact way, and the third one was beautiful right. in the sense that he wept for the other person who caused the harm because that person is wounding themselves. That's a good way to look at it. So yeah. In other words, how sad that that person is hurting themselves. And more to the point, the compassionate person in you should look to say, 
why is this person so angry? Why is this person saying false things about me? What are they going through? What pain are they going through? Why are they hurting? Put yourself in someone else's shoes. Right. Jesus Christ, on the cross, he made excuses for the people that were doing this to him. So I will be, you know, honest and say I'll be the first to say that, you know, when I am falsely maligned, I get upset, um, and I really shouldn't. The reality is, is that when someone says something falsely or uh, judges our character in a way that we don't like, uh, we need to ask ourselves: Is it true? If what that person is saying is true, okay, then I need to change. With God's help, I need to change. If it's not true. Then endure and say, okay. And pray for them. Pray for, I'll always pray for them, but to live in the in the upright way to say that, you know what, regardless, God will take care of me. God took care of St. Nictatus. God took care of Abraham. All the bad things, all the lies, all the things that they went through in their life, God always blessed them and took care of them. The way I look at it is that, you know, when bad things happen or lies are said about me, I look at it as well, if it's God's will that I be protected, that I will be protected. And no matter what anyone says, no matter what lie anyone says about me, I will be able to conquer and go forward. However, if it is God's will that I endure this and that it is for my soul to be humbled and harmed, then I know that he will preserve me because I am not better than St. Nictadios who endured all of the lies and the scowling and the scourging that he went through his entire life. And even when he died, he was not redeemed until years later. And then the sanctity of his soul was shown to the whole world. I'm not better than him. And so therefore, if he was able to endure those things, despite the fact that he is so holy, I've got nothing to say. So I have to trust that one way or the other, God's will will be done. It's up to me to live the kind of life that is okay. That I can look at myself and say, you know what? I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> All right, everybody. I'm very, very happy for us to be back uh, in the saddle again. I pray everyone has a blessed and wonderful week. Uh, tomorrow morning at 630, we'll be having the liturgy for St. Uh, Maximus the Confessor. I think Dr. Ed, you and Dr. Marine are going to be there? Yes, I believe so. All right. I pray everyone has a wonderful night then. God bless. Bye, Father. Bye.